Don't ask me. Ask China that question. You may get a very unusual answer. Canada is collaborating with China to begin trials of a vaccine candidate for COVID-19 here in Canada. Why is Canada's ambassador to China criticizing China's actions during the pandemic while this Liberal government is defending it? COVID-19 has made life more expensive and more difficult for seniors because of the risks of more severe outcomes. COVID-19 has exposed some uncomfortable truths about our society, including how we care for seniors in Canada. Federal government can do things to help is to make sure that we have enough PPE. It's Sunday, May 17th. I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block. I think it's clear that there are many questions for countries around the origins uh, and behavior in early days on uh, the COVID-19 situation, particularly questions for China that we've called on uh, uh, to need to, to be asked in the coming, uh, coming months so we can get answers. There is going to be, and there must be, a great reckoning um, for the role that China has played in this. That was Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Alberta Premier Jason Kenney, who has taken a hard stance against China for its handling of coronavirus. Australia is calling for a full investigation of what Chinese authorities knew about COVID-19 and when they knew it. So what is the Chinese government's response? Joining me now is China's ambassador to Canada, Pei Wu Song. Welcome to the show, Ambassador. Thank you for having me. Ambassador, a lot of Canadians have questions about where COVID-19 originated from. Some think it may have leaked accidentally out of a lab in Wuhan. Others believe it came from a wet market there. Where did this virus originate? You know, that is a very serious uh, question for the scientists to answer. And all the available evidence now suggests the virus itself is not man-made, it comes from uh, nature. And uh, for us, we believe we should let the scientists to answer the question rather than to hear from some politicians. Uh, there have been calls, Ambassador, to find exactly that information out through an international investigation into the origins of the virus. Will your government allow that to take place or will you punish countries who are in favor of that? For China, we also support a, a review committee to be established by WHO, but that should be uh, you know, taking place in an open and a transparent manner and at an appropriate time. That is after the, we win the fight against the pandemic. Currently, we believe all the countries should focus their energy and attention on fight against the COVID-19. However, I think that for this kind of uh, uh, review, it should be inclusive in nature. It should address the global response to the COVID-19. And for us, we have taken the most strict and the comprehensive measures in fight against the disease, and uh, we are making great progress on that. But if you can see, for the United States, it has uh, lost the precious time they had fought you know, from China, because we had issued early warning to them, even from the very beginning, starting from the January 3rd, we have been updating the United States and the WHO and other countries in a regular way. But China initially did not release accurate numbers and is facing allegations that that was deliberate. I know that there's been a lot of confrontation between Donald Trump and your government. Ambassador, what's your view of which leader has handled this crisis better, Justin Trudeau or Donald Trump? So I think each country has its own way to deal with the crisis. But here, I think that in Canada, we also have noted that under the concerted efforts for the federal government, and the provincial governments, they are making progress in the fight against the disease. So there are some provinces who are now planning to reopen, and that's encouraging news. Canada's ambassador to China, Dominic Barton, had some tough words for the Chinese government. He says that your government's response to the pandemic has been alienating foreign countries and allies because you've taken such a heavy-handed approach. Uh, and others have accused China of essentially using bullying and economic tactics to punish countries who speak out about this. What's your response to Ambassador Barton? From the information we got, the report itself, it's infectious. So I think that 
For us, uh, when we are developing relationships with other countries, we are pursuing a foreign policy, independent foreign policy of peace, and uh, we are engaged in friendly exchanges with other countries. So there is no things like bullying other countries. Rather, China is a victim not only of the disease itself, but also a victim of disinformation. So, so you can see some politicians in the United States, they are waging a political campaign against China, try to smear China's image. And that won't help in their fight against the disease and to save lives of the American people. Uh, Ambassador, there are two Canadians who have been in jail in China, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. It's now been 18 months. It's hard for a lot of Canadians to hear you describe China as a victim when there are two Canadians behind bars there with no evidence in a case that people inside the Canadian government will tell you is essentially hostage-taking over the Huawei incident here in Canada, with Canada arresting the chief financial officer of Huawei, Meng Wanzhou. There's nothing like hostage taking. You know, those two Canadians are actually suspected, engaged in suspected crimes of endangering Chinese national security. So the competent Chinese authorities are handling the case according to law. And I would like to tell you, they are in a good physical condition and their lawful rights are protected according to law. But I would like to take, uh, to take this opportunity to point out that actually the biggest issue in our bilateral relationship is still Meng Wanzhou's case. So that's why we have made our position very clear, you know, to make sure that she's back in China smoothly and safely. And you will not release the two Michaels until that happens? There's an ongoing judicial process, you know, for the two Canadian citizens. Uh, in the case of the two Michaels, the Canadian embassy has not had access to them now in over four months, and there's deep concern about their well-being. I, I know that Canadian authorities have asked to at least have a video call, like you and I are having right now, with the two Michaels, or a phone call to check on their well-being. Your government has refused that consular access. This is all happening as Meng Wanzhou was here in Canada. She's in a mansion. She's able to go out for jogs. Why will you not give the Canadian government access to the two Michaels? Madame Meng should not be detained in Vancouver in the first place. And for the two Canadian citizens, we are making sure that they receive, you know, all those treatment, you know, uh, in, in accordance with law. So that's why during this outbreak, we have provided better food for them, not only for them, but for other detainees to increase their immunity against the disease. And we also arranged for a special telephone conversation between uh, Michael Cowery and his father, that also on the basis of a humanitarian consideration. So anything that we can do according to law, we will make sure that happens. And for the consular visits, it will be resumed if the situation improves. Can you tell me when that will resume or when you could organize a video call for Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor and Canadian government officials? Yeah, I think that my point is very clear, you know, it's a, we want to make sure that the safety and the health of those detainees are protected. So as long as the situation gets better, you know, we will resume these consular visits. Uh, and I understand what you're saying about in person, but I guess that doesn't answer the video call. But I, I do want to move on to ask you, what is the relationship between the Chinese government and a group known as the United uh, Front here in Canada? You know, I've seen some reports, you know, about that recently. And for the organization who initiated the report, actually, it is, uh, actually, people would recognize it has the uh, intention to have these rumors around. For China, we have never engaged in anything like to interfere in other countries' internal affairs. That's all, not our tradition. And if you talk about human rights, uh, I would like to suggest that we should first be alerted to the spike of those discrimination against the Chinese people and the Asian people here in Canada after the uh, COVID-19 broke out. So, sir, then you deny that your government in any way has been involved in intimidating Canadian citizens of Chinese descent who are living here in Canada? I have 
said that clearly, you know, there's nothing like that. We don't interfere in other countries' internal affairs. So there's no such thing happening here in Canada. What about the report the Global News had about the collection of personal protective equipment by the United Front that was sent back to China at the same time as the Chinese government was not releasing the full severity of the pandemic? Was your government involved in taking that personal protective equipment from Canada back to China, knowing that could cost Canadian lives? So there is nothing like we are holding back those supplies. And I would like to point out that actually we are doing a lot of things to help Canadian people in the fight against COVID-19, just as recently you helped us. You know, so we value that. There's a good tradition of our two countries helping each other at those trying times. No question going forward. Everyone hopes there will be global cooperation on this pandemic. Ambassador, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Up next, seniors have been hardest hit by COVID-19 on the health front, and many say it is causing a financial strain on them too. What is the federal government doing to help this vulnerable demographic? 80% or more of the deaths in, during COVID-19 have been seniors living in long-term care homes. The military had to be called in. Out of 14 countries, Canada has been deemed the worst in its care of seniors. Welcome back. That was NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. There are nearly 7 million Canadians over the age of 65. And as you just heard, they have suffered more than any other group in Canada with this pandemic. The tragic deaths and outbreaks in long-term care facilities and nursing homes has exposed the vulnerability of our seniors and raised questions about their care. And for those living at home on a fixed income, things haven't been much easier. It's a frightening situation for many. So what can the federal government do to help? Joining me now is Seniors Minister Deb Schultz. Thank you so much for joining us, Minister. Thank you very much, Mercedes. I appreciate being on the show. Yeah, the number one group who we hear from are people in your portfolio, seniors. They've been very concerned about COVID-19, and many of them have been really hard hit, both financially and health-wise. Now, I know that long-term care homes are the purview of provincial governments, but with 80% of the deaths of COVID-19 in those long-term care facilities, what is your government looking at doing to support the provinces to make sure there's a strategy in place and to make sure that the level of care is consistent across the provinces? Uh, very early on, uh, we were aware that there were challenges in, the, in these facilities. Obviously, they're regulated by the provinces and territories. However, we brought out uh, with, uh, in conjunction with the public health authorities across the country, and in conjunction with them, we brought out guidance so that long-term care facilities could be making sure they put in the proper protocols to keep their residents and their staff safe. We also uh, put a significant amount of money on the table and uh, engaged 24-7 in getting the pr protective equipment that's required uh, in these facilities to keep everybody safe. It's a very tough market, uh, a global shortage of this equipment. So we engaged quickly our, our, all of our resources 24-7 and also engaged with businesses across Canada to start building it um, it right here at home so that we wouldn't be dealing with these challenges for very long and we are working on that we've put money in for wage subsidies because we know that people were in essence underpaid uh for the work that they're doing and certainly needed to to see the recognition for their hard work and be encouraged to continue to go into those facilities and care for our seniors so that was three billion dollars that we've uh, provided to the provinces and territories to help them with that and, and we've also brought in the military where we've been asked to provide resources uh, with very significant shortages in staff at certain facilities. So 25 facilities that we have uh, our federal um, military uh, in those facilities. So the, the, the federal government has been very, very engaged in this file, providing all the support, bringing a Team Canada approach to this, uh, this situation on the ground. And, and, you know, there are serious underlying challenges that are being you know, faced in these facilities. And in the coming months, the federal government will be there to work with the provinces and territories to find lasting solutions. Does that mean that you could look at long-term funding to the provinces that the federal government would provide? Because once this particular wave of the pandemic is over, there could be a second wave. And some of the issues that have been exposed are longstanding. 
our focus is entirely on doing what we need to do today to keep people safe and to deal with the, the issues that are coming up. And there will be time to reflect with the provinces and territories what other steps need to be done. Last week, your government announced a one-time payment of up to $500 for seniors to help offset costs that they're facing. Most seniors will only get $300 of that through the OAS. Why did it take so long to come up with this money when so many seniors were saying they have increased costs and in everything from refilling prescriptions monthly now to having to have their groceries delivered to not being able to get on public transit safely? So. Early on, uh, we initiated a GST credit top-up that provided on average single seniors from low and modest income, $375 for singles um, and uh, $500, over $500 for couples. So that was early on uh, and they got that money in April and we saw that, that, that there was need for more. So that's why we brought forward this announcement this week that we would give $300 for OAS recipients and an additional $200 for GIS recipients. So just to put that in context, if you're a couple on G Guaranteed Income Supplement, you will have received over $500 through the GST top-up that you got in April, and now you'll be receiving $1,000 through this uh, one-time tax-free payment. So for them, they will have received one over $1,500 of direct financial support from the government for the pandemic. That's a significant amount of money to support our seniors in need. Your government campaigned on a promise to increase the OAS. That was supposed to happen in July. Are you still on track to do that? So right now, uh, we are completely focused on what needs to be done to get Canadians through the pandemic and to be able to uh, bend the curve of, of the virus uh, transmission keep our public health systems uh, at below capacity and make sure that Canadians can get through as they're doing the important things like staying home and not, uh, and not exposing themselves. Uh, while the government is com completely committed uh, to implementing our campaign uh, platform promises, our focus right now is where it needs to be, is in keeping Canadians safe, providing them the support that they need to get through. So does that mean that seniors shouldn't expect to see this in July as your government had promised? So what they're, what they're going to be seeing is a significant uh, payment, a tax-free payment that's coming soon. In They don't need to apply if they're on OAS and over uh, 6.7 million seniors are on old age security. They will be receiving $300 in their bank accounts. If they are low income seniors, uh, they will be receiving the guaranteed income supplement additional $200 without they don't need to apply, it's going to be received. So that's $500 in addition. But Minister, that's, that's, the, that's the pandemic relief. I'm referring to your mm -hmm. campaign promise. Is that not going to happen in July now, that promised increase of over $700 to the OAS? So as I've said, right now our government is completely focused on helping Canadians through the pandemic and we have committed, we are committed to, uh, to delivering on our promises, but uh, right now the pandemic is taking all efforts and energies and that's where our focus is. Okay, Minister, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your time too. Have a great day. Coming up, as provinces begin to reopen, what rights do you have when it comes to returning to work? And what obligations do employers have to keep people safe? As people start looking at going back to work, there are going to be lots of questions about safety, about childcare, about uh, next steps. And we're going to work very closely with the provinces, with industries, with employers, uh, with people to give uh, as much clarity as we possibly can. Welcome back. That was the Prime Minister last week. Lots of questions for Canadians as they get ready to head back to work. So what rights do you have if you don't feel safe on the job? And what obligations do employers and businesses have to make sure the workplace is safe? And could they be liable if it's not? Joining me now is employment and labour lawyer Howard Levitt. Thanks for joining us, Howard. Thanks for having me. You know, so as provinces reopen and workers are getting ready to go back to work, employees perhaps back to offices, a lot of folks are wondering what rights they have. So what rights does an employee have to say no to going back to work or to keep working from home if they have concerns about their workplace? Well, they have no legal right 
work at home. That's entirely up to the employer, even if they can prove it's more productive and efficient at home. But they do have a right to say it's unsafe at work. The employer will then have to explain to them why it is safe, what, what measures have been taken to make it safe. And if the employee still refuses, then either the employer or the employer can go to the Occupational Health and Safety Inspector, who will come in pretty quickly these days, and make a binding determination. Once they determine it's safe, or if the employer does one or two things, it will be safe. If the employees can come back to work then, they'll lose their job, they'll lose their serve, they'll lose their EI, they'll lose everything. Wow, so I'm imagining for people out there who aren't even worried about their workplace, but might be worried about transit, they wouldn't have any protection there if they have to get on public transit and they're worried about being exposed. Well, they don't have to take public transit. They can find other means of getting there, theoretically at least. But public transit has not been held to be an excuse to avoid coming to work. Fear of public transit. What would the obligations of the employer be to make sure that their workplace is safe? Make it safe. But require social distancing. Have sanitation stations everywhere. Have washrooms readily available. Ensure people clean their hands. Make sure anybody with COVID symptoms or flu-like symptoms stays home and does not enter the workplace. Discipline people who reach any of those rules and do what they have to do to make the workplace safe. That might mean shift work, that might be limiting the number of employees, that may be workplace redesign. But whatever they have to do, they have to do because if they don't do it, an employee complains, I think it's dangerous, and they come, they say, the employer says, come in anyway, and that employee or another employee becomes sick with COVID, and let's say, God forbid, dies, there could be a massive lawsuit against that negligent employer. So companies are liable, potentially, if they're not providing a safe work environment. They absolutely are liable for not providing a safe work environment, and that is the biggest incentive of all probably. Do we have a sense of, of what that would be in this case? Because typically, I mean, obviously, there have been health and safety regulations for many years, but this is a whole different kind of health and safety issue. Yes, and the workplace inspectors are getting trained in that. It's now a matter of social distancing and washing your hands an awful lot and wearing masks or personal protective equipment where necessary, but making sure you don't get close to someone who might theoretically, for all you know, have COVID. So social distancing is the main name of the game. And maybe people have to take stairs or in the elevator to get to work, depending on what floor they're at. But whatever it takes, employers have a duty to make sure their workplace is safe. And that duty might require an entire workplace redesign. Will there be any reassurance to people who are working that they'll be compensated if they stay home sick beyond when this pandemic's immediate sort of center moves aside? In terms of compensation, no. If they don't have a sick leave policy, they don't have short-term disability benefits, if they don't have any sick leave protection at all, that doesn't change. And when any, whatever protection the government is giving, when the server runs out, they will not be paid for time home sick. They have a right to stay home sick, but they won't be paid for it, unless the company already has those benefits. Some very useful information. Thank you so much for joining us, Howard. Thanks for having me. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson. We'll see you next week.